Courtney. Now, Rochdale has been firmly put on the map by not only the legendary Gracie Fields, but also by another versatile performer, Mike Harding. He's a musician, comedian and also a writer. Indeed, tonight he has his own world premiere of his latest play, Last Tango in Whitby. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Rochdale Cowboy. It's hard being a cowboy in Rochdale. Birds don't fit, but I'm the close. Oh, nice no, thank you. Nice <laughs> like, you. Not so much looking like a Rochdale cowboy, but it's like kind of one of those Brits who goes to live in Greece and becomes an artist. I'm growing, you're very rude to point this out, but I'm growing my hair for a part in a film. What is it? The King and I. <laughs> you asked for that, didn't you? <laughs> but the, the last time you came, you had a three piece suite on. Well, my mother watches television. She's one yeah. of the three people that watch this programme, and she said, if you go on there with a sweater on again, I'll kill you. So I wore a suit for it last time. Yeah, it's very and nice. And now I'm in my so I've decided it's summer because the sun's shining. So that's you all. just need a, a straw hat. Now, this is three times in three years we've met. I know. There's a farmer in my village back in the Yorkshire Dales called John Murdoch, and he's convinced that you and I are having an affair. Every time I go on the programme, he says, you and her have got something going between you. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, you were looking at her. I said, I've got to look at her. She's asking me questions. <laughs> three she times was in you. three years, well, you see. Them. So there's nothing going on, John. Nothing going on, John. And he's got his wife here today as well. So there's definitely nothing going on. Now, look, last tango in Whitby? Mm-hmm. What, what, what's it? Why? I went to Whitby and it was an, an out-of-season gig. I've got that sort of uh, office, you see. They sent me to Whitby in the middle of winter. <laughs> And um, at the end of the gig, we got back to the hotel. We're staying at the Royal Hotel in Whitby. And it was full of old-age pensioners. I thought, what, what's happening? It's the invasion taking over, you know. And um, it was a saga holiday, and it was a dance week. And for about £87 for the whole week, they got full board and a dance each evening. Mm. And we sat in the bar watching, and they had the time of their lives. And I was watching, I thought, these are people are talking to each other. They were dancing together. They were having a really good time. I thought, hey, life doesn't end at 45, you know. These people are enjoying themselves far better than a lot of young people today, mm. going to discos and you can't even hear people speak, you don't know who you're talking to, who you're dancing with. And while I was watching, I noticed the two people who ran the entertainments were dressed as pearly kings and queens. And though everybody in the room was having a great time, these two people didn't seem to be getting on very well together. They were relating to the dancers and all the rest of it, but there was something going off. And I have the sort of mind that just skates off on its own and I imagined the pearly king having an affair with one of the old ladies, and they fall in love in the course of the week and then run away together. Oh. So from there, it was just the, the way my mind works. It was just a question of fleshing out the characters and getting it all to happen. So it is a comedy. It's a light-hearted comedy. It's um, a scenario of passion mm. uh, set in Whitby out of season, and it's a sort of very gentle comedy, unlike the usual sort of bang away sort of stuff that I write. Wasn't this usually uh, going to be originally going to be on television? It was written for um, a TV and Yorkshire Television gave me, this is where your money goes folks, gave me four and a half thousand pounds for the options and then didn't use it, you know. And I'm glad they didn't in the end because it's given me a chance to rewrite yeah. it as a stage play. And I think it's, to be honest, it's better for the rewriting. Ten years on, yeah. I've rewritten it and I think it's far better, a lot more happens. Does age worry you? No, not particularly. I mean, I've often found that some of the greatest characters I've known and do remember are people who've got experience of life. I mean, oh. youth is great, and I love nothing more than children, but there is a callowness or, and sometimes a cruelty about youth, which we've all gone through. We've all gone through that stage of laughing at your gran and all the rest of it. And when you get a bit more mature, you realise that life doesn't stop. Like I say, at 45, there's a lot of fun and life in oh. characters. And some of the characters that I've come into contact with in the course of my life, particularly in the Dales, have been wonderful. We had an old policeman who used to live in our village called Laurie. And it's a very sh short story, I'll tell this very quickly. Yeah, go on. But Laurie was in, he was the last of our policemen and he was belt and braces one Sunday morning having his breakfast and there's a knock on the door, he went, and it was the sexton from the church, he said, Laurie, come here, come and look at this. And he went across to the church in his breakfast stuff, he hadn't got his uniform on yet, and he said, what is it? He said, look at this. And not to put too fine a point on it, somebody had had a crap in the church porch. And well, I mean, there's no point in beating around the bush, you know what I'm talking about. So somebody had done this, and he said, look at that, that's disgusting. So, listen, sit up and listen. So he said, that's disgusting. Laurie said, that's disgusting. He said, what are you going to do about it? He said, well, there's no name and address on it. <laughs> he said, I'll tell you what, if nobody's claimed it in three months, it's thine. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's true. I've not made that up. You ask anybody in Ribbles, do you? Oh, dear, that's oh, dear. That's true. Oh, should, oh, have dear. should I not have said that? No, it's all right. It's quite fine. Let's not draw attention Well, what to about it. him saying the best pucker-upper in the business at the well, beginning? Nobody knew what he was he saying. He got it right anyway. He didn't. We he heard it, it in right. there. It was phone calls. It's been ringing since one o'clock. Let us raise the tone slightly. Sorry. Your daughter is in this play. It's about time she got a proper job. Was it, I mean, have you worked with her? Have you had anything to do with direction? No, or? Sarah. Sarah went into the business entirely without me either pushing her or saying don't mm. go. She saw enough of my life to realise that it wasn't all a bed of roses, that you live out of suitcases for a lot of your life and you've got to travel a lot of the time. You spend a lot of time on motorways and trains and things. But she's always wanted to be an actress ever since she was little. And she'd get all the kids in the area into the shed and she'd put on a show for them. And she was always, of course, the princess. Mm. Everybody else had to do all the donkey work and be the ugly sisters. She was always Cinderella. And I just watched her and she went to university, did a degree in English, and she decided after that she wanted to... She'd always worked in the theatre, as a, in the youth theatre and as an amateur. And she eventually went to drama school, did a course, and she came out and worked. The first six months she did, she toured with The Hobbit. And then she did three months playing the little French girl in Jane Eyre. So I said, that's good, all the money I spent on you. You've been a hobbit and a frog. <laughs> but she's, she, nothing to do with me. Ken, who's directed Last Tango, phoned me up and said, what about Sarah for one of the parts? I said, don't ask me, I might be a dad, mm. but you, you know, you're the director. You cast it. So he auditioned her and said, fine. And the interesting thing is that she's come up with a few ideas and said things to me, and I thought, yeah, she's right. You know, she's found it. Difficult, but she's managed to be objective mm. about the piece, which is a good thing. Now, they've just said to me, a minute and a half. I know you're quite a political animal, so here is your start of a ten. A minute and a half, please, on the poll tax. Oh, no. <laughs> well, I've actually worked it out. This is God's honest truth. My poll tax came this morning, £1,400, and we used to pay £350. This is in Yorkshire, right? 350 quid on the house for the both of us. Now, they've doubled the poll tax because it's regarded as a second home, which it is. I have to work in Manchester, but I really live in Yorkshire. So there's Pat and I now paying £700 each, which is £1,400. We don't get to the swimming baths, we don't get to the library, we live up a track, we have our own spring water, we have nothing at all. We get one bin liner a week, if you're watching, Joplin, well, my MP. One, one bin, bin liner a week. I've worked it out at £33.5 a bin liner. It's not bad, that, is it? <laughs> not a bad deal. Now, you're touring at the moment with a high-tech magic picture show. What's that? I went to the mountains in Nepal and in India two years ago to the Himalaya and I did a film for Channel 4 mm. on the destruction of the Everest and Annapurna area. There's a lot of human excrement and toilet paper left along the trail. And we call the film, you may have seen it, Everest the Soft Way, the Kleenex Trail. Oh, right. Everest the Soft Way. And I took thousands of pictures and now I'm going around the country with a sort of ecological tour talking about the mountains, showing pictures. And I've also got a lot of music that I wrote when I came back from the mountains and the whole show lasts for about two and a half hours and it's looking at the mountains to some funny stories because you can't go there as me and not get funny things happening to you but and of course you've it's ecological quite, yeah. so you've got to clean up your your words as well that's you? right oh, I'm very God, careful. thank Family you very audience. much thank indeed you. for joining us today Thanks a lot. <laughs> I am Yeah. There is nothing wrong with starting with saying pucker up, as nothing you know. I may have just said it rather you, quickly. What did you think? You heard Friday, it. Friday, yeah. Friday, an important day for Daytime Live. Hosts, we are playing to the Broadcasting Press Guild Awards tomorrow. Be here or be square. No, be there. Or be, be square. square. See you tomorrow. <laughs> Ta-ra! Bye-bye. <laughs>